to introduce our panel. So this is the session on the future of digital learning, an ominous uh, commentary, an ominous, ominous statement. Uh, so uh, at this point in time, um, what I'd like to do is just introduce folks uh, around. So Karen, why don't you say hello? And then just in the order that folks are there listed, just go ahead and grab the mic and say hello and good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Karen Flello. I'm the principal of the South Island Distance Education School, but I'm also the president of the BC Distributed Learning Administrators Association, and I'm really honored to be here today. Thank you for having me. And good morning, my name is Frank McCallum. I'm the associate principal for Vista Virtual School. I'm based out of Calgary, Alberta. Uh, I've been doing distance education in some form for the past two decades or more, and looking forward to uh, well, sharing and hearing what's happening across the country. Good morning, my name is Amy Sandville. I'm the principal of Regina Catholic Schools Learning Online. In my role, I am able to support fully online education as well as blended learning opportunities in our school divisions. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Todd Pottle. I'm the executive director of the Ontario eLearning Consortium. So we're a consortium of about, uh, well, 25 school boards spread throughout Ontario, and we share uh, e-learning course offerings and students across all of our districts. So uh, also, I'm an online instructor for Queen's University. So great to be here, Randy, and uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Canyell. I'm the CEO of LEARN. I'm situated right now in uh, the Laurentian, just a little bit north of, uh, of Montreal. Our role at LEARN is really to serve the uh, educational needs of our community uh, right across the province, and we've been doing this uh, since uh, 2005. Thank you. Hi there, and finally, I'm Michael Barber. I'm an Associate Professor of Instructional Design at Toro University, California, in lovely Vallejo, California. Thanks, folks. Appreciate that. Just saw a couple of questions going by in terms of the setup. Yes, this is a different Zoom account than what many people are used to. This is the webinar account. Uh, and Zoom has done a lot in terms of uh, ensuring about the security. Uh, there were some bad user experiences, as we're all familiar with. Uh, so we wanted to at least model some uh, tighten down secure uh, set situations. We're going to use the webinar setup here for the plenaries because it's a little bit more presentation or a couple of people talking to you, so less interactive. But for all of the breakout sessions, all of the workshop sessions, it's in Zoom meetings, which we're all familiar with. You'll have text chat, video, breakout rooms, all sorts of interactive pieces. We tried to keep it a little bit less here because we've got about 400 people. And by the way, there's now over 80 sessions in the workshop schedule over the four days. So really happy to, uh, to see how it's expanded. And all, of course, at the last minute. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Canadian eLearning Network, it uh, really came from events like this where we decided that rather than talking to each other in socials and at uh, events uh, in the US at large conferences, that maybe we should do something locally uh, in Canada. And uh, so seven years ago, we created the national network and partner with all of the provincial uh, initiatives in digital and online or blended learning uh, that are occurring. So this is just one that I personally have been involved in actually for most of the 17 years that this thing has been going on. Not always uh, run by me, sometimes helping out, sometimes just a participant like others. Uh, and Karen, uh, I know, hosted in one year and David is part of the, the hosting now as well. So Can Learn is us. Uh, it's not a separate organization and uh, it's just all mostly volunteers and those of us that come together to try to share uh, expertise research. And Michael Barber is one of those volunteers who's a, our original uh, uh, honorary founding member uh, as well as host. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what's here. And well, I want to acknowledge and thank Brad uh, Breitkwitz for doing uh, some of the moderating in the background here. So I really appreciate that because one of the things that we've learned if, if you want to actually be effective, you can't present and moderate at the same time. Very two distinct roles. Um, so just wanted to sort of walk through a national survey. And if you uh, are familiar with the state of the nation, Michael uh, may come in and talk a little bit more about that, that research that's there. But, you know, all things are not equal across the province. Different programs, different approaches in each of the provinces because education being a provincial initiative. So what happens then, therefore, is everyone is different. Sue Taylor Foley, who's also on our board, is with the Ministry of Education in Nova Scotia. So she sent along some things and slides to share, and I thought they actually kind of represented, I think, nicely um, 
how it approaches. They have a, 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 a provincial program that runs across for all. But their focus has been, in terms of digital learning over the past, has been in terms of equity, flexible design, meaningful. So you can see the list. It hits all those large metrics that we're trying to do in, in K-12 education. Uh, but that becomes their sort of their mantra is part of this. And I know all the programs across the country have been in this same thing about being inclusive, accessible, dealing with equity. Those are all the triggers that are really important, but how it becomes and rationalizes in the world and the context is different for us. So in terms of what they're thinking of what they're doing, they want to get more micro-credentialing, a little bit more towards in Quebec, and Michael, you can talk a little bit about the sort of the, the competency approaches in terms of the curriculum there. So it's tying curriculum together with practice in digital media spaces is really what where the focus becomes and then with teachers uh, which now they're all thrust into this is about expanded use of platforms to engage in learning so that's part of what our four days is to look at as well to see how and where we can do this so the problem that's hit us is though is emergency remote teaching so uh, we're going along nicely and building up, uh, as you well know, all of you uh, involved in this. And then all of a sudden, bang, we get this, this pandemic crisis, and now everyone has to transition online. And so we've used the term emer emergency remote teaching because the preparation for all of us that have been involved in this medium for over those years has been long with lots of challenges and lots of uh, learning to apply uh, into it. So online learning is a little bit different than just what's happening here. So what we wanted to do was share some of those perspectives. When you think about what's happening right now with kids at home, it, it, it's not this. We, we wish that, you know, parents were creative and could do all this stuff and, you know, I'm gonna learn to do the fiddle and I can learn how to build this, I'm gonna build my rocket ship. You know, it's more like this that's happening right now. So the challenges are in terms of getting attention outside of that. And I think that the person that I follow a lot, uh, Tony Bates, uh, and if you're not following Tony, you should, and certainly sign up for his blog. It's really, triage is not the same, and that's what's happening right now that Tony talks about. So I think it's really important to have that. So back to concluding in Nova Scotia, before we jump into Michael and Quebec. It's, Nova Scotia is focusing on a common set of tools. And, and I know that many of you probably, when you were do, going through this, that was the, the direction your district was looking at as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Michael and to Todd uh, for this. So I'm gonna just turn off sharing right now, Michael, so that we can get the cameras back up. Over to me, Randy. Over to you. Okay. Um... Well, you asked us to speak very briefly uh, about what was going on in our province and give you a little bit of an overview of what's happened here. Uh, like most of you, back in mid-March, uh, we got notice from the Ministry of Education that our schools would be shut down for a temporary uh, period of time, a week or two. And they even told the teachers, think of this as like a, a mini vacation. Everyone sit back, relax. Um, it would be fine. Um, when it became obvious that this was going to go well beyond the two-week uh, uh, um, span of time, uh, there was a great deal of anxiety and stress uh, within our community, uh, especially among parents and students who were asking, well, what's going to happen to our school year? Um, we're going to lose everything that we've fallen behind. And uh, the reaction from our community was, again, one that uh, is uh, well-intentioned, but uh, there was a tsunami of resources and uh, things coming out at, uh, at parents. All of our school districts were uh, throwing things out and as we looked at uh, everything uh, coming into the community, it was, uh, um, there were just so many things and not curated in such a way that parents could really use them. The ministry stepped in and said, well, we're gonna try to organize some of these things. However, keeping in mind that everything is voluntary, we can't, uh, there's no coercion, we can't force the teachers or the, the parents or students to do anything. So they op or created what was called uh, l'école ouverte, the open uh, school which again was a, something unique for us because typically our school boards do not collaborate, they don't share, um, and our Ministry of Education is typically a little late uh, coming on board. Uh, this time around, everyone decided, well, more or less decided, that uh, they were going to have to share resources and uh, um, create a common uh, a space. Uh, and uh, we worked in conjunction with some of the local universities, and a lot has really gone on. And uh, for the first time ever, we've seen some uh, interesting uh, 
uh, things come forward. Um, what really helped uh, parents a great deal was the fact that there are no year-end exams. Everything is voluntary. Um, they did ask the teachers, however, to come on at least once a week to meet with all of their students or to con connect with them in one way or uh, fashion or another. Again, this has really not been that successful. You've seen it's gone. Uh, if teachers coming on in some places, other in, uh, others, they're not even reaching out to them at all. And they're using what they're calling the tools pedagogique, which are like teachers uh, uh, toolkits. Uh, and uh, the ministry, along with organizations such as Learn, we've been putting together all, all kinds of resources for teachers to help them uh, work through all of this. Um, meanwhile, uh, at our at our end here at Learn, uh, we have our virtual campus, and we've been doing a lot of things. Uh, our, our online classes with our students have continued, and uh, we are now up to about fifteen thousand uh, uh, tutorials on, on a weekly basis. So we have thousands of kids coming on and doing this, and the parents are loving it, and it's all real time that seems to be working well but generally there's a prevailing feeling overall because there's a lack of a direction still as our ministry tries to catch up uh, to all of this a, a sense of feeling of frustration and concern over where we're going uh, we've seen a lot of parents organizations call on uh, more uh, distance education um, but in the meantime as i said it's been a, it's been really haphazard and uh, a little chaotic our private schools have been doing it and it's with moderate success. Uh, I'll, I'll stop now. I don't, I'll, I'll keep it short Randy, for now. Great, thanks. And folks, I think you have access to the Q&A. So if you want to ask a question, just pose it in the, uh, the question and answer option uh, for you, all the, the attendees, and then we'll come back to that as well. Uh, and Brad, if you don't mind monitoring that as well, that would be great. Thank you very much. So I'm going to turn it over to Todd. Uh, Todd, if you want to I'll get your slide up for you. Oh, I can do that, Randy. Uh, is, if sure? it's okay. yeah. Oh, yes, you yeah. can. Yeah, some things have, okay. uh, some things okay, have just... changed. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> there was another ministry trying. announcement last night, so I had to update, uh, wow. update my slides. So if you want to start okay. sharing, then yeah, I can. Nope. Sorry. Okay, well, nope. well, thank, thank you so much. My cursor went away. It was going all over the place. So. <laughs> Well, I just want to echo, I think it was Shirley just mentioned there in the chat pod that she's witness to it all and, and has children at home. I've got four, uh, ranging from a special needs daughter at 13, and then twins who are 15, and then a third year university student who's home from Ottawa. So uh, yeah, I've witnessed it all as well, certainly. Um, so Randy, I'm going to put on my timer because you know what I'm like. Um, so when it beeps, I'm going to stop talking since I, I know that we have five minutes. But you know, I thought that the, the best way to uh, kind of encapsulate the, the whole, you know, fluidity, which has become a, a very common part of all of our, all of our vernacular right now, is to uh, capture this in a timeline of, of what exactly is happening in Ontario. And I do actually, a little different than Quebec, I do have to tip my hat uh, to the ministry. I do have to tip my hat to the way that they've been communicating uh, with the school boards and the way that the school boards have been interpreting those messages and putting it into practice. So, uh, but it all starts you know with most March 12th right we got that two-week announcement the kids were, I know in my house were very happy to hear they're going to have a two-week extended break and uh, then March 20th came and, and they they launched phase one of the learn at home program and just want to show you uh, very quickly what you know what that's like uh, so the learn at home program is offering resources uh, so these aren't teacher-led resources. They're, they're developed by teachers, you know, for students, but it's a, it's kind of supports for them that they can learn independently, you know, and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, where, where it's possible, uh, you know, with the involvement of their parents or from the parents and, you know, and others that are around them physically. Um, but they, we do have uh, TBO Mathify, which is fantastic. Uh, in helping them with their math skills. And then uh, in Ontario, the ministry writes content. Um, I've written, well, I've been on a couple of course writing projects for the ministry, but they write content, uh, subject specialist writing, vetted very rigorous, rigorously um, for all of our courses, you know, here in Ontario, English and French for the majority of our courses. And so that's available. And then for download and, and uh, activation in our uh, provincial LMS or VLE virtual learning environment, which is D2L's Brightspace. Uh, so I'm just going to go back here to my timeline. So, so that was uh, put out and, and, you know, there was some use of it, but then March 31st came and they said, well, you know what, school closures are actually going to be extended to May 4th. 
And uh, at the same time, they said, we're now going to uh, bring the teachers back in um, and we will have teacher-led learning. And so that's where we've been ever since, is that there is active teacher involvement. The expectation, the minimum expectation from grade nine to 12 is three hours of work uh, per course per week. And then boards were charged with the um, with the task of creating continuity of learning plans. And so just to give you a kind of an idea of what that, you know, how that was manifested in our various boards, most boards would survey their students to access, uh, their student access to tech and internet. Uh, then they would have to deploy tech to the students who were in need of it. Uh, then there had to be a plan put in place and a process for hard copy distribution, uh, which has been happening. Um, and uh, there's the teacher training portion because a lot of our regular teachers, even though we have a very strong blended learning program throughout all of our schools and districts throughout the province, uh, there is, um, you know, this is different. This is going to be uh, learning very remotely. This is more towards e-learning. So there had to be uh, teacher training there and then the migration of their face-to-face -face content into the online platforms. Now we do have a ministry license D2L that's used, you know, free for use for all of our educators in, in publicly funded institutions. Uh, but there's also the options to use Google Classroom. We have uh, a lot of our boards or GAF boards and make active use of Google, um, Google Apps for education. And then, of course, we have things like EDSB as well, and that list goes on. Then they set up a tech support line, and then, of course, very important, the mental health support lines as well. So all of that's been in, in place, and those are just a few of the things that kind of comprise continuity of learning plan. April 3rd, they announced uh, no more. There's not going to be any midterm report cards, uh, but there will be midterm report marks for our uh, graduating students because those are required for entrances into colleges and universities. And they did say that, that announced final report cards for everyone. Uh, then April 3rd came and they had to push the deadline because we have what's called OUAC and, o and OCAS, which are the services through which students in Ontario apply for acceptances into various college and university programs. There was no way we were going to be able to meet that deadline. So we, uh, that got pushed uh, to May the 1st, which was great news. Then uh, we had the ministry announced on a, a few days later, the support for families one-time payment of $200 if you're, for every child in your household from 0 to 12, and then 250 for those 0 to 21 with special needs. April 14th came, and as we suspected, the closure was, expend, was extended to May the 4th. Uh, so a little different than how it's happening in other provinces, kind of a you know, gradual approach here. Uh, April 15th, D2L announced, I was going to share it with you, but I'm running out of time, a quick start care package, absolutely incredible. Um, it's kind of for those teachers who are, you know, don't have experience in, you know, in working in the provincial VLE, which is D2L's bright space, or don't have experiences as e-teachers, kind of a quick start guide for how they can get their courses up and running in D2L, um, you, you know, just using those very basic types of functions um, and they have uh, the guides they have the videos they have online support etc for that april 17th partnership with rogers and apple which you may or may not have heard of in the in the news out, uh, out west Twenty one thousand ipads with free wired, uh, wireless uh, data was provided to students who didn't have access to tech and internet um, and then april 26th um, that was when that was last night they announced well we're going to extend the closure to may 31st and our exam days and remaining PA days are now replaced with instructional time. So that's kind of where we are right now. Um, we are closed until April, until May 31st, and we will await further directions from the ministry. Thanks, Randy. Uh, there was a question from Nick uh, about with the tech support, is there for parents or is it for, um, the teachers as well. So what tech support is being offered to teachers? I think Nick, to reiterate your question. To re you know what, that's a fantastic question. And it is, uh, just going back to my meeting controls here and then stop the share. Uh, so it is available for both. Um, but it, it's different in different boards, right? Each board, we have 72 school boards in Ontario and each board has its own continuity of learning plan. And so I just know can only speak for, for our board, uh, which has been fantastic. Um, for my student, for my kids, uh, that support line is available for, for parents and for, for students. 
just to give you an idea about my own kids, you know, I've got a, uh, like I said, I've got a, a, a 13 year old special needs and she just finished actually. So I'm in the living room. We've got you know, people working in different houses or different places throughout the house. She has one and a half hours every single day with her EI, with her uh, EA online and is brilliant. The things that they're doing. And uh, my twins who are, who are 15 years old and in grade 10, uh, you know, they've been doing videos, they've been doing uh, collaborations, they've been doing book reads with uh, with groups and whatnot. So it has been going, from my perspective, very well, at least in my household. Terrific. Um, and uh, how many, I'm sure that you all saw sort of a, a chronology of <laughs> your own experiences uh, with going through Todd's detailed piece in terms of looking at that. So I think that helps us to, uh, to understand a little bit in terms of... Uh, what we've gone through as well. So, uh, Amy, do you do you want to run your own slide deck, or do you want me to set it up? Um, can you set it up, please, Randy? Okay. So awesome. I just I, yeah. Well, it just what happened was. Um, or we was, can go without the slides too. I just don't have it ready to go. Whatever is easier. That's, a, that's all right. So. Uh, I'll start talking, and okay, you can bring it up. Perfect. So I'm going to share a little bit about the perspective from Saskatchewan. So in my role, I'm the principal of a fully online school, but as well support um, teachers who use our Moodle LMS in a blended classroom. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the fully online and the, the blended. Um, in Saskatchewan, we don't have a centralized online program. And so we have just under half of the provincial school divisions actually have online programs, as well as one independent school and one First Nations Education Authority um, has that. So when schools were closed um, physically on March 20th, there wasn't just a provincial body ready to take that over. And so on March 16th, we did receive an announcement that the schools would be closed on the 20th. And in Saskatchewan, schools are closed indefinitely. We don't know when we will be um, back in the schools. We suspect probably not until the fall. A reopened Saskatchewan plan came out last week and schools were not specifically included in that plan. So we just don't know what the timeline looks like for when we'll be back. Um, so what happened is on the 20th, schools were closed for um, a week and there was a pause in education operations and during that time the ministry met with the different school division leadership and put together an emergency response plan that would guide us um, through the next steps and essentially in that emergency response plan we were directed to provide students with that key essential learning that would help students get through um, the rest of the year but also we're directed to use multiple delivery methods so um, not just one online method. We were um, challenged to use other methods as well to deliver that, as well as the instructions to parents that they were not expected to provide to schedule one curriculum to the students that they would be supported by teachers. So what we've been doing is very similar to what um, Todd was explaining is happening in Ontario a little bit later with teacher directed um, education. The teachers are delivering the content, the teachers are assessing it and then communicating with the students. How that delivery looks like is different from um, division to division and based on the resources that they have access to, um, their communities and whatnot. So some are copying their fully online courses and putting all of the students and teachers into those and, and running it that way. Others are directing um, their teachers to use a common platform. So everybody's gonna use Moodle or um, Blackboard and they would um, have some consistency with what the delivery method is. And then others are just directing their teachers to use what they're currently using um, to keep things simple for teachers and students and things that they're familiar with. That's what our school division is using. So we are um, using the platforms we're familiar with. So if you're using OneNote, continue to use OneNote. If you're using Moodle or Seesaw and whatnot. So, but we are providing our teachers with training and resources, pre-built lessons to help support and whatnot. But the key message we've been sharing is engagement, that the most important part is engaging our students with um, the content. If we can keep students engaged, then that education piece will come. Um, and also to help take care of that social emotional um, well-being of our students. So the big challenge is to keep things direct and simple and um, engage our students. We have seen some challenges in Saskatchewan, which I'm sure are not unique. Um, the biggest one is access to technology. And when we say access to technology, so it's not just students that have no access, it's access to adequate technology. All of a sudden you have families that might be sharing one computer and you have two parents and multiple children working from home and that could be a challenge. And um, in our school division, we have been able to provide one device per household. And I know that's happening in other parts of the province as well. But in addition, we are creating um, work packages that are being picked up at schools or delivered in a safe manner so that students do have access to learning even if technology is a barrier. Another challenge we've been finding are teacher expectations. I think 
Um, when schools closures were announced, some of them thought they were just going to pick up and exactly replicate everything that's happening in their face-to-face um, -face classes fully online. And that's just been kind of helping teachers see what's possible, what kind of things they can do. Um, another challenge we're coming across between um, with our education technology team is teacher training. It's just hard to remotely train large number of people on different platforms and get them all up and running as well as efficiency. Some teachers are finding it a challenge. They are able to deliver content, but those real efficient tools that we are used to using in our fully online programs, those take time to learn and to create and implement. And I think they just find it's not as efficient to you know, have a document emailed to them and download. So I think those are things that we need to look at um, moving forward. Of course, there are successes. So um, I think this is a very safe and forgiving environment for teachers to start using technology. Everybody's pretty understanding that it's not gonna be perfect. There are gonna be bumps in the road. So for our teachers that have been resistors or hesitant to using technology, they have been thrown into it and they really don't have a lot of choice, but I think it's a great way for them to practice and hopefully um, the lessons and the skills that they're learning now will be taken moving forward. And I also see this as a way for us to change some of our current practices. So again, um, what we had to do out of necessity could become a really great thing moving forward. Um, where we see moving forward, um, where I see for this, like for distance education specifically, is that we are seeing an impact on our distance education program. So when um, the announcement came at 11 o'clock on March 16th that schools would be closed indefinitely, my phone started ringing at 11.02. <laughs> And by 11.30, we took our registration down because <laughs> it's because things were crashing and we saw a massive increase of people inquiring to get into our program um, from within our school division, but from other school divisions as well that didn't have a distance education program. Um, one school division that left their registration live, the two week period, um, the last week were schools before they physically closed in that um, education pause, they saw over 129 different registrations come in for the program in a two week period. So um, there will be an increase in, um, in enrollment, and that's gonna come with challenges, although I'd love to say that it's great for our enrollment to increase, but then we are gonna be facing in the fall um, challenges with how do we staff and training. And I think as there's more uncertainty with what things are gonna look like moving forward, um, we could see more um, students moving there. And so I think also too now as um, distance programs and distance leaders and e-learning leaders, I think we have a responsibility to help build that capacity within some of our face-to-face -face teachers. Uh, until there's a vaccine or a treatment, we are gonna see some uncertainty and we could have um, students who are away for because they're sick or maybe have to self-isolate for a while. And so they're away from schools, even if they're open, or we might see delays to schools opening or even opening and closing for a short period of time to deal with outbreaks. And I think one of the things I'm looking at now is how can I increase the capacity of our face-to-face -face teachers so that they can you know, be better prepared to deal with some of these issues down the road. All right. That's Thank you, Amy, appreciate that. And again, that's mirroring, I think a little bit, uh, there's a couple of questions in there. So um, thanks Todd for uh, replying back for Shirley. So we can keep it going in the chat. And just a reminder, as Brad has indicated, for those who are attendees, make sure you selected panelists and attendees, then everyone will see the conversation going by. So um, Frank, over to you. Thank you very much, Randy. And what is happening in Alberta is not so different from a lot of other places. But if you go to the next slide, Randy, when, uh, when schools were closed, um, and I realized the date on this particular online um, <laughs> online news story is March 27th, but we were basically closing out on the 15th, 16th. But there was a clear statement from the Minister of Education from the get-go that uh, instruction would be moved online. Much like other places, much like Saskatchewan, the closure is indefinite. It's pretty clear that it's going to stretch into the summer. And with recent comments by the Alberta Chief Medical uh, Officer of Health, um, summer schools in many jurisdictions are also on the block because the uh, prohibition against gatherings has continued. So basically everyone knew from the, the start that they were gonna be moving into some form of online delivery. There is no consistent uh, spring break across the province. And so when this announcement came out it was just before the spring break for the majority of uh, Alberta divisions. So your Calgary publics, um, some of your larger cities, uh, a number of the rurals, um, they were all going out at the same time. So I envision a lot of panicked uh, um, teachers over their spring break uh, working to get to online delivery ready to go. Much like other places, 
emergency remote stuff. There are some divisions that have uh, online infrastructure. There are some that don't. Um, there is a centralized uh, distance ed provider in the province, the Alberta Distance Learning Centre or ADLC, and in my conversations with them uh, since this started, over half the teachers in the province are now accessing some form of resource or service from ADLC. So from the start it was pretty clear there was going to be online delivery. The Minister made general sweeping comments around this wouldn't interrupt uh, uh, students' educational programming, that marks would be submitted, so on and so on. But Randy, if you can move on, as with every other province in the country, it's in the details that uh, things started to emerge. So there were um, very specific guidelines and procedures that were put out by the Department of Education uh, two weeks into this. And most notably was around the completion of classes. So while the minister had said there will be final marks provided, what the minister didn't say is, based on the delivery of the content. We have a number of folks, a number of parents and teachers, when you get in, or pardon me, parents and students, when you get into their expectations, they were calling us within a week saying, okay, so I'm gonna get a final mark for this class that I started four weeks ago. No, you will not. The directive from the Department of Education is around completion of classes. The classes that were started should be brought through to completion. In the cases where that's not possible, and quite obviously there are a number of areas, um, career technology studies. If you're working on welding, I mean, we can't send a welder out to your house. That's just not going to happen. So there are a few situations where uh, courses can't be completed, and so there are processes and procedures put in place to ensure that credits are provided. So the completion of classes was definitely one that was not in the initial headlines and has caused some challenge around parent and student expectations because they're basing their um, questions on, well, this is what the newspaper said and things have, have uh, changed since then. In our school, we primarily use online resources and so we very much continue to as uh, uh, business as usual. Much like in Saskatchewan, we, before any of this even really got going, we pulled down our registrations for the first five um, business days of the, the, the closures, um, knowing that we were going to run into the, the exact sort of situation that uh, Amy has mentioned. Um, anecdotally, I mean, for us, online situation is normal. Uh, in many of our schools, uh, teachers were thrown into the deep end of the pool and they have been swimming immensely well. Uh, I have nephews who are in the system and what I have observed is that teacher proficiency has improved markedly, exponentially even, over the past number of weeks. And so while initially there were just a couple of postings and maybe a few worksheets, as teachers have become more engaged with how they're delivering in their platforms, um, what I'm seeing is a lot more interaction, a lot more video, a lot more um, um, specifically designed activities around the new platform, which is, which is good to see. Um, provincial assessments, like every other place, provincial assessments have been moved off the table. However, provincial assessments are required for a number of folks who need high school credit. So in this province, we do have traditional homeschooling where students are essentially um, doing their own curriculum. And if they want high school credit, they need to write a provincial assessment. Well, if all provincial assessments are canceled, then how do those homeschool students receive their credit? And so there are some uh, aspects of this that have to be addressed in terms of the provincial assessment. Even though they're canceled, they can't be 100% canceled. Um, I guess, Randy, we can move on to the next part because Again, the, the challenges that we're seeing in Alberta are not much different from other places. So first of all, there is a lot of activity in online courses. Well, as Amy said, that's a good thing. But again, the core of good online teaching is again still the relationship between the teacher and the student. And so while our technical infrastructure is quite strong and is scalable, you know, if we want to move from 10,000 to 20,000 students in a Moodle system, we can accommodate that but we can't do that in terms of the human resource. How does a teacher who's working with 150 students suddenly work effectively with 400 active students? That becomes very difficult. Uh, in the middle of all of this, our provincial government passed an austerity budget that uh, is heavily impacting uh, at least the future of online learning in the province. 
schools that uh, use online resources or deliver primarily using online resources have taken a heavy hit on the budget. And so there's no way that uh, the current level of online service can be supported for the next school year. Uh, in addition, the central provider, ADLC, uh, is basically been threatened with closure in uh, 2022. And so this central provider, which is providing currently over half the teachers in the province of Alberta with uh, uh, digital resources and services, at least is publicly announced as being closed in two years. Clearly that's gonna be an issue. And then not just into next year, but uh, in, into the current year, um, the minister originally said there was not gonna be any impact on the current education budget. That kind of went away. And a couple of weeks ago, the uh, government clawed back um, over $100 million in education funding, which resulted in the removal of EAs, which as Todd has pointed out, are absolutely vital for online delivery of some sort for students in special needs. So there are some definite funding issues. And then of course, we got the transition next year with prerequisite skills. While there are a number of processes and policies put into place, they're not being um, adhered to with the same level of consistency across the province. And so we're already seeing that some students are receiving credit in courses for which they no longer have the full skill set. And as they move into the next school year, that's going to present any number of problems. So good, bad, ugly, you know, I don't think Alberta is uh, markedly different from any of the other places that, we've, that have already um, talked about this, but we've got our own little unique challenges that we can see in the coming uh, years. Thank you, Frank. Uh, yes, um, very much so. Karen, do you want to, I'll stop sharing if I can get my cursor back over. If you want to um, application share your new slides, I wasn't able to get them. Uh, in for that, but uh, just as a sort of as you're setting up, Karen, just to, I, we can hear the story of uncertainty that exists and continues to exist across as well. Um, and I think there's a lot other economic issues that cover and over overshadow a lot of this. Certainly for Alberta's situation in terms of the economics around the whole um, industry-based uh, pieces. So, so again, every day forward is a different sort of step um, and we're just really not sure. It's heartening to hear across the country that a lot of the teachers that were thrust into the deep end of the pool are actually starting to figure it out and start to work reasonably well with that. Are there any other sort of uh, insights, the rest of the group, uh, while Karen's getting set up, uh, that you can provide? Any thoughts come to mind? Some of the esteemed, Michael, do you, Barbara, do you have anything sort of to say? And folks, I do, I want to apologize. I did, re, did not realize that some of my Zoom windows were over top of slides. I'm learning that and I didn't realize that not being a, uh, an attendee that you can only shoot a message to the panels, uh, panelists. Uh, so we've shut some things down, but we're learning. We'll be really good by the time we get to the, the closing uh, keynote there with Michael on Thursday at noon. So Karen, are you good or do you want me to, to run? Oh, I can see the look. She's still setting it up. Randy, I could just add that uh, there's a lot of there's a silver lining in all of this. And, you know, I look at some of the things that, you know, are, are teachers who, who probably um, haven't had a great deal of experience and success, you know, with blended learning and whatnot in the past. And just to see the some of the risks that they're taking, the successes that they're having and, and, and celebrating that. So, you know, that's good to see. And also our own students becoming problem solvers. The problem solving skills for, for even my own kids, and I'm sure this is not uncommon, uh, you know, has been fantastic. So just a couple of silver linings there. Not to mention patience. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Appreciate that. I'd um, add one other silver lining in there is the fact that I think a lot of school leaders now are starting to realize that many folks aren't trained in this and there will likely be local incidences of this happening during the 2020-21 school year. There may be a second wave coming. So come September, whenever we do get back into the classroom, I think you're gonna see school leaders put a greater emphasis on not just training teachers on how to make this a little seamless the next time it happens, but also preparing students on, you know, here's how to learn using these tools as opposed to just here's how to use these tools. I can hey. jump. 
jump yeah. in here, Randy. Mentioned uh, reading over the weekend. There's a uh, a site in the in the states called Student Voice, and they were asking about remote teaching, remote emergency teaching, and uh, basically the feedback from students hasn't been very positive. Coming, this is again uh, out of the states, and I don't know how representative it is, but they were talking about how difficult it is to learn at home. Uh, uh, distractions, setting up a routine, communication issues. There's um, even a spotty technology. So. Uh, um, one of the things that I'm concerned about is that uh, while we are being provided with a, uh, an opportunity to really put our best foot forward as, as uh, online educators, um, there are many occasions, many places where it's not being done well. And in fact, we're getting um, uh, some shade thrown, us, thrown on us. We have some private schools here where uh, their idea of teaching online, remote teaching, was simply providing uh, uh, some videos where they lecture at the kids and then uh, give them some exercises, and this is online learning. Um, we have to do a lot of work in uh, re-educating or, or, or properly informing people that uh, there's a whole lot more to, the, uh, to it all and that it does require uh, a lot of work. And just one last thing is to mention that where you have a competency-driven a curriculum such as we do here, um, getting teachers to develop and work on developing uh, competencies in an online environment requires a lot of experience and a lot of uh, planning and organization. You have to be able to work with kids, uh, students in, a, uh, in, in groups, in uh, breakout sessions and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of challenges ahead. I think they're wonderful opportunities, but uh, we have to recognize uh, that uh, there, there are certain challenges and problems that have been put forward uh, generally for us. Thanks. Thanks very much, Michael. So, Karen, do you want to go ahead? Um, yeah. Can, can you see my slides? Does that yep. work? Yeah, we're seeing them. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Um, so, one of the things about being last on the panel is that just about everything I had planned to say has been said. So that's awesome. Um, but one of the things I did want to uh, want to uh, to bring out is the notion of uncertainty being one of the worst forms of trauma. And in British Columbia, we've had a lot of uncertainty recently. Um, in the last year and a half, two years, we've been looking at. Um, it is similar to what Alberta is experiencing right now, we've had uh, sort of the ground rules laid out for some really significant changes. And up until February, we were really focused on um, looking at proposed funding and, and as a result, proposed changes to DL um, that were coming our way. And then in February, we found out we had a bit of a reprieve. We were calling it a stay of execution. And, um, it, and it was going to be okay for at least a year while the, the, ministry figured things out a little more with a little bit more detail so we uh we started thinking about september 2020 which was awesome and then uh and then COVID hit so no business as usual for anyone lots of uncertainty uh and hence lots of trauma and right away um the ministry of education began exploring how to implement emergency measures and it's it's a difficult balance the notion of trying to create certainty in a time where we are all uncertain um, and and give give districts that have um, you know geographical and situational expertise the autonomy to be able to do what they need to do um, it would have been really nice to have had assurances about how it was all going to go down but in fact they would have been the only people to have been providing assurances because we're all at the mercy of the virus of course and we need to accept that as our truth so um, First of all, when, when we think about where we're going, where we're sitting now and where we're going, um, there are some challenges. And I think um, Michael's point was an important one. Um, been scanning social media and, uh, and we've seen everything from the sublime to the ridiculous. But one of the hardest things has been the, the amount of criticism that has come the way of distributed learning. And what we're doing is not DL. What we're doing is remote emergency education. And that's such a critical point to be making right now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm reading from, from teachers I respect, from parents I'm related to, you know, it's never meant to be online, it's substandard, it's wrong, it's not possible. Um, but it is possible. We do it every day and we do it for students who are vulnerable. We are do it for students who are able to learn and to thrive. Um, and so we really need to be clear what we're doing is not, you know, in our province, in our country, around the world. It's not DL. Um, it's remote emergency learning or emergency remote learning. And, 
and things like equity of access, capacity of families to support the learning at home, um, capacity of teachers, those all need to be considered. Now, our, the educators in our neighborhood schools have had to completely change practice while they're in, under tremendous stress themselves in all aspects of their lives with no training and no lead time. We all know it's taken us years. Um, you know, I, I, I was easily two years in as a teacher before I really felt like I, I was on it. Um, we know there's trauma and grief connected to everything we're living right now, and it's normal for, to look for something to blame um, because everything is so far beyond our control. But it is not a problem of online learning or DL learning that is to blame. And we need to really be sure that it's clear to those who are planning our futures um, when the COVID rules change, um, as Michael says, that this, the bad rap we might be getting now is, is not okay uh, because we are not, this is not what we do. Um, so that's an added layer to, to DL at the time of crisis. And to be fair, we haven't had to make as many changes as our neighborhood school colleagues, and I, I, I freely admit that, but we still have had to make a lot of changes. Um, in BC, um, we've made our curriculum done a bit more sharing, as, as was mentioned about Quebec, a bit more sharing um, and making, making curriculum more widely available to our colleagues. So the province is providing Zoom licensing, uh, WCLN and Navigate and Sides are providing courses through three different learning management systems, Moodle Canvas and D2L Brightspace. So those are, those are open to the province um, and, and Canvas and D2L made their, their stuff available for free until the end of June, which is awesome. So we're able to share out things for people who need it. And there's, there's been a fair bit of uptake there. Um, we've been taking time to provide guidance to our colleagues directly or through workshops um, about best practice. We, DL schools have been changing assessment practices um, and we had a temporary closure of enrollments, not unlike many of you. Um, ours at our school is gonna go until May 15th. Other schools have, have you know, sort of picked and chosen their times to, to return. Um, but we're still not sure what the summer is gonna look like. There's conversation on the one hand that we're gonna be back sometime at the end of May and others that say we're not going to have summer school this year. So we're not sure what it means for DL um, other than we are going to be open for business, we believe. And, um, and so we're going to be opening registrations. Um, and like everybody else, we've been responding to those individual concerns of students. Some think we're not doing enough of instruction and guidance and some are just looking for the quick pass. You know, the minister said I would get through and I would graduate, um, you know, and, and bless his heart, he was doing his best to reassure people, but he did us in a way, you know, didn't do a favor for us as we try to make sure that people understand that learning and credentialing are not the same thing. Um, so, you know, what are we learning now? Because we are learning a lot. Um, innovative use of tools, video conferencing for meeting with students, um, and effectively supporting colleagues who are new to the platform and to remote learning expectations. You know, no, you're not going to be able to do every single thing you plan to do between now and the end of June, and that's okay. The kids are going to be all right. Um, working collaboratively from a number of different locations, having faith in our own resilience and our ability to innovate and be nimble. Um, those are great and, and we are managing uh, quick change more than we thought. And finally, the importance of our work and how we can use the experience accumulated over two decades of teaching and learning online to guide what education faces now. And back to that point, this is not DL, this is emergency remote learning. So, um, you know, just because I'd like to end with something that's feeling good, I'd like to end with a real quick story. Um, we've been touched by the words of putting humanity first and uh, our, our uh, chief medical officer, Bonnie Henry, Dr. Bonnie Henry, talks about, um, you know, the place to begin is to be kind, be calm and be safe. And if we can't provide certainty, we can replace it with little acts of compassion and empathy. And one of our EAs, and sympathies to Albert on this one, um, one of our wonderful EAs uh, was working in Zoom with one of her students who is an eight-year-old child with Down syndrome. And, um, and our student was sad because she, she wanted to be with Kirsty, not just, not just see her online. And so Kirsty, in a moment of inspiration, ran to her daughter's room and grabbed a stuffy and then invited uh, Eliza to get her, her own stuffy. And then they each hugged their stuffies. And that was their way of connecting. 
Um, and that's become their ritual of connection. And I think we're all finding our own rituals of connection, whether it's colleague to colleague or, 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 or teacher to student or EA to student. Um, we, we have a sense of physical as well as, as the voice and the visual online. And that kind of caring is going to remain crucial as we go on. So that, uh, that I think is where I'd like to leave us. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate that. And, and apologies about going a little bit over time, folks, uh, but we'll wrap up at the, the quarter mark uh, and give you 15 minutes to shuffle into the next sessions. So any, any closing commentary here before I do a little bit of a transition? Michael or uh, Aaron or anyone else here in the group? Maybe just mention there's a good article uh, or an interesting article uh, by Peter DeWitt in Education Week that just came out this morning. Um, it's worth reading again. I sound like a really, really negative person here. I'm not, but just the dangers and risks of uh, emergency remote uh, uh, learning and uh, the dropout and the reason why a lot of the kids are not attending. Uh, uh, there, if there are no grades, why go? They don't have good teacher student relationships. So, worth a read in education. I, I think it's a cautionary note. And I, I know we've just touched on this uh, issue, etc. Um, there's a couple of other sessions further on in the program. I know that. Michael, we can maybe field some things. Uh, I've got a session just before yours on Thursday that we can bring some of this forward. But folks, uh, we posted a few questions here, but also we've got the shared documents. So we'll be active in there if you want to poke away at a few folks. If you want anyone to come back um, in the session that you'd like to hear more from the, the panel, let me know and I can certainly reach out, see if they're available. We can slot them in. The beauty about this we, we're making up uh, new agendas and new, new workshops as we go. So if we do want to revisit some of these things that uh, resonate throughout, uh, we'll talk a little bit more at the end of the day, but we can certainly restructure some things for that. Any other closing comments? Randy, I would just like to really echo what Karen said about um, particularly here in Ontario where we had uh, a lot of controversy when uh, e-learning was under the limelight uh, when consideration for it to be moved mandatory and uh, yeah, everything that we can do and, and certainly you know can e-learn has been absolutely fantastic whatever we can do to have the public understand certainly that this is uh, an emergency intervention that this is not the true this is not true e-learning um, and though even though our true e-learning programs continue on as they always have uh, we would hate that the impression of the public would would be that um, you know what teachers are doing and doing extremely well in terms of migrating from face to face to the uh, online platforms is not the immersive types of engaging e-learning that that we've uh, all built and are very proud of with the help of our and I can see there's a few attendees here our TELT contacts and our DELCs throughout our province Great, thank you, thank you. I was just reflecting on, on our backdrops and one of the things that we don't think about a lot uh, and what they might say to us. Karen is studious, I'm trying to get out the door. Don't mess with Amy, because uh, she's got a punching bag right behind there uh, on that and, and no one will let Thomas in the, in the school. He's stuck in the parking lot. So uh, we know that Aaron loves the mountains, which we already know. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to say thank you to our panelists and to everyone here. Apologies for the little glitches as we will get this refined and get better.